The Lord be with you. Thank you very much. There are various texts that we're going to look at today. So I have a feeling that everyone in the room was raised that when you're given something, when you're given a gift or other thing or kindness, that you write a, th- a thank you note. I know in our house it was kind of the, the bane of the kids after Christmas or a birthday that they couldn't really, I mean, we let them a little bit, but play with the stuff or cash the check, whatever it happens to be, until they wrote that thank you note, right? Until they got that done. And I have a feeling, again, that most of you were raised in that type of environment. When something ha- positive happens from someone else, you thank them. You say thank you, and you, you say it in a very tangible way. So let's just up the ante just a little bit. I'm not just talking this morning about... Uh, you know, getting a gift at, at Christmas, getting a gift at your birthday or anniversary or a kindness shown to you. But I'm talking about today someone actually putting their, their life on the line for you. Someone that actually, in fact, you know the Lord Jesus Christ gave up, gave up his life for you. And what does that do for us? Well, in order to get at that, uh, let me just tell you a couple of stories. Uh, so uh, the first one is, uh, it was probably 2004. Four. It had to be 2004. Uh, Robin and I went to New York City on our anniversary, 15th wedding anniversary trip, uh, and we went to Broadway. We saw Fiddler on the Roof, and uh, Tevier was, by the way, Doc Oct in the uh, Spider-Man movies, if you know who that, that actor is, but great. I mean, just great show. Let's out late, and so we were leaving the show. And we decided, you know, it's midnight, so why not get McDonald's french fries, right? I mean, it sounds really good. I mean, <laughs> and all God's people said, <laughs> right, amen, all right. So, so we decided to stop. It was kind of an odd one. It was kind of like in a hovel just kind of sticking out, but tons of people from Broadway there. We were getting our fries, and there's this real big dude behind the counter, about six foot, four inches tall, and he said to us, looked right at us. Well, there's a crowd, looked right at us, and he said, which way are you guys walking? Because he it was obvious we were walking towards our hotel, and he saw where we were going. I pointed. He said, no, no, no. You don't go that way. You go this way, and you'll be safer. Well, clearly, in the moment, he knows the neighborhood. I don't, you know, so I'm just with my nice little bride of 15 years. I'm going to take her down to Dangerous Alley, right? You know, and so he saved us in that moment. I've never forgotten that. I mean, that was that was 17 years ago now that that happened, and just really cool thing. And I should pause for a minute and say, in fact, as we walked away, I kind of looked back to see if there were wings, because I think it may have been Gabriel, all right? Uh, you know, picks us out. Hey, Joe, we need you in the kingdom. Don't go kill yourself, all right? So, all right. So that's one story. I'll give you a different story that's a little more uh, intense, and that was when I was a youth worker in San Diego, we would regularly go to, to Disneyland, and then a little bit further was Magic Mountain. So it was about two, two and a half hours from where we were in San Diego of a drive. So one weekend, we decided to go with the youth group, and we got up super early. We drove up there, get into the park. We're there all day, hot, sunny, sunburned, right? And about 10.30, 11 o'clock, decided to drive all the way back to San Diego. So on the way back, we're about an hour out of San Diego. I fell asleep at the wheel of a 15-passenger van filled with kids. All right, so across across the lanes, and thankfully, Melanie Matthews, I remember her maiden name, she's married now and has kids old enough to have kids, but Melanie Matthews cried my name out really loud and stopped me in the moment, and I was able to jerk awake and then be okay. Needless to say, that was a long time ago, and I remember it like it was yesterday. And, and why? Well, why? I mean, I owe those two a debt of, we, Robin too, but owe those two a debt of gratitude. They helped me in that moment. They kept me from death. But let's take it just one more step. What if, in fact, a police officer took a bullet and died a bullet that was destined for you? What if a firefighter ran into your house and saved you but died in the fire? What if... If you're a soldier, if you're in the armed forces, and someone takes a grenade for you, they die, but you're saved. I mean, I'm thankful to Melanie. I'm thankful to Gabriel or whoever it was in New York City, right? But imagine in that moment how you'd feel about that person. 
how indebted you'd feel to live your life in a way that, that uh, honors them for what they did for you, the, the magnificent gift. And I think you get it. You understand that's exactly what Christ did for you. Oh, falling on a grenade, that's easy. Taking a bullet, no problem. Dying in a fire, not a big deal. Compared, compared, that's all a big deal, but compared to what the Lord Jesus has done for us. And so he calls us, because of that faith, in his life, death, and resurrection, he's brought us to that place where we're forgiven of our sins, given entrance into heaven, or as you've heard your pastor say a few times, I'm loved by God and going to heaven when I die. I'm loved by God and going to heaven when I die. As a result of that, Christian, we live our life as a thank you note, you see. We live our life as a thank you note to him. It's all right. Let's start with our redemption, and it's something, of course, that you know, but we need to talk about it. So Romans 8, 31 to 39 very famous segment. If you're a visitor today, uh, the Blue Bible, the page that, that's in front of you, the page number's on the screen, if that would make it easier for you. And I should tell you, by the way, I had recently interacted with someone. I want to make sure you understand, it doesn't matter if you're just starting out in your Bible knowledge or if you got a PhD in theology. We're for everybody, okay? Please don't be embarrassed if you don't know a lot of stuff. It's okay. Uh, we're here to help, you, to help you do that very thing. So, all right, Romans 8, the whole thing is amazing, right? I mean, it's a crazy, amazing chapter of the Bible. Uh, but 31 to 39 is probably the most quoted segment. And so Paul writes, what shall we say to these things? And what is that? The gospel, of course. If God is for us, who can be against us? I mean, that changes everything, right? Nothing can harm you. The worst thing that you can think of, death, can't even harm you. Why? Because he's taking care of that for you. God is for you. And he's for you in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's where Paul goes. Verse 32, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up. How? For us all. Gave him up for us. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. That, that's the second time in Romans 8 he said that, that God is interceding, uh, Christ is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? This is the beautiful segment. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake we're being killed all the day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors. How? Through him who loved us, and may I insert, died for our sins and rose again for our justification. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm going to say it again. I'm loved by God and I'm going to heaven when I die. It's true about Joe. It's true about you. If you're a Christian today, that's what God has done for you. The absolute surety of your faith. It's not about you. It's not about you keeping yourself in the faith. It's about God doing that. He brought you to faith. He'll keep you to faith, keep you in the faith. He'll watch over you day and night, and nothing, not one thing can harm you. That's the truth of the gospel for you, Christian. And as a result of that, then, we live our lives as thank you notes to God. Amen? Amen? Knowing. I don't have to guess. How, how many times have I said, 1 John 5, 13, John writes, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. You don't have to guess. It's not a hope for it. It's done. Paid in full. Done and done by the Lord Jesus Christ. So, all right, I'll do it again. Because of what God has done for us in Jesus as we sung about just a moment ago, I, I don't know about you, but I cry through the goodness of God every time we sing that song, right? How good God has been to us because of that. The amazing, eternal gift that he has given us. We live for Jesus every day. Let me help you with that with a, a verse here. And so uh, 1 Peter 2.9, uh, again, uh, a verse that is probably familiar to you. Let's say it together. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now notice the first half of that 
is about our station, that we are chosen, that we are called, that we are a priest, a holy priesthood, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. That's who you are. And, and those words, by the way, were spoken about Israel, and they're spoken about Israel known as the Christian church, because that's who we are. We are the continuation of Messianic Judaism. If you don't understand that, read Romans 9, 10, and 11. It says that very thing. We're grafted into the tree of Judaism, you understand? That's what Christianity is. That, that's who you are, but as a result of that, notice that you may proclaim the ex, that you may proclaim, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous night. Now auto, automatically we go. Well, that must be proclamation of the gospel, telling people about Jesus, and yes, it's that. Of course. But this is the thing. Your life speaks about Jesus Christ too. Your life speaks about who you are in Christ. In, in fact, uh, you've heard me tease about getting a, a tattoo on my forehead that says, I am a Christian. You think that would change my behavior? Mm-hmm. Right? We don't like putting Christian bumper stickers on our car. we got to drive like one. Right? Yeah, I mean, you understand... You understand, if everybody knows you're saved, likely you're going to act differently in this world, okay? But that's not the reason you do it. The reason you do it is it's a thank you note to God. Well, how does that happen? Well, notice what Paul says in Ephesians 4. Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires. He, he, he's very wordy here, so I had to shorten it. And put on the new self. So Put off your old self, put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. All right, so what does that look like? Well, flip over to Colossians chapter 3, <clears throat> verses 12 to 17. And what I'm gonna, actually, what I'm going to do is have you go to verse 1, Colossians 3, 1. We're just going to read a couple of verses there first. But so <clears throat> I'll say it again. You know, if you have the moniker across your forehead, I am a Christian. If, if uh, it's known, you would live differently. But really, the reason we live differently isn't because of that. It's because of what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. And so that's how Paul starts this segment, chapter 3 and then verse 1. And let me remind you one more time. We've done this before. But the if then there probably should be since then. Not if then, but since then. All right, so since then you have been raised with Christ. Seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things on earth. For you've died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. Uh, sorry, in Christ and God. When Christ, notice what Christ is. Who is your life appears, he's your life. Then you will also appear with him in glory. All right, so we're to set our minds on things above and not on things on earth. So what does that look like? Now flip over to verse 12. So Paul says it this way, similar to what he said in Ephesians. Put on then as God's chosen, holy, and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, Forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also, or also must, forgive. And above all these things, put on love, that is, God's love. Put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, which indeed you are called in one body. And be thankful, part of why I chose this, this text. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another with all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And here you go. Whatever you do in word or deed, whatever, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, my, my, uh, my thought is let's skip the tattoo on the forehead. Let's just put that last verse over our door, doorpost as we go out every day. Whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do. How often are we doing whatever we want rather than whatever we do, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? And you know that it's true. Your, your constant struggle between, well, the, the old Latin, simul justus et peccator. And all of you go, oh, amen, Brother Joe, right? Amen. Simul justus means simultaneously righteous et peccator means and sinner. You are righteous and a sinner at the same time. There's a, 
a war going on, and yet God calls us to live in our Christ nature, to live that every day. Put off those things, anger and hatred and malice, all of those things that belong to our old nature, and instead live in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I don't know how many of you have read the Chronicles of Narnia, all seven books, but it's good. It's very good reading. And by the way, you, you know, it's Technically, they're children's books. Uh, it's kind of, well, it's kind of like the old Bugs Bunny things where it was for kids, but it had adult stuff in there, you know? The same thing is true about the Chronicles of Narnia. But in book three, uh, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, there's a character, Eustace Clarence Scrub. Eustace Clarence Scrub. And it's so funny because Lewis writes, his name was Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved it. All right, and so, and so Eustace was the, the really nasty guy in book three, and interestingly, he was so nasty, he became a dragon. So here comes Aslan. Aslan, if you don't know, it is the Christ figure, and so Aslan takes his claw and rips open the dragon skin and pulls it apart so that Eustace can come out, you see. That's a beautiful imagery, right? Clearly, we know what C.S. Lewis was writing about, that's us. What has God done for you in Jesus Christ? He has given you, yes, everlasting, never-ending life. He has given you the presence of his Holy Spirit, but he's caused you to have what you can only have by faith in Jesus, and that is a Christ nature that says no to sin and yes to God. No to sin and yes to God. And even, by the way, things we think are no big deal, like gossip and anger. Setting that stuff aside and saying, God, I don't want to have anything to do with it. More and more, God, I want to live for you. I want to love you in every part of my being and to have it true about me that whatever I do in word or deed, I do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, the first thank you note that you're writing is how you live in our world, how you interact with people, how you show that you're different, that you aren't just a child of the world, but you're a child of the King of kings and Lord of lords. How do you show it every day? Well, there's another part to this, though, and it's reaching into people's lives. And yes, you know I'm going to say this because I believe in this. Our world needs Jesus. People are, are afraid. They need Jesus. You have him, and you can bring him to them. And so, yes, Bringing, I'll do it this way, bringing the bread of life to people. But it's more than that. It's also bringing bread to people. So the end of uh, the, the segment, we always quote Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. You know, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Praise be to God, right? But notice what, what Paul writes by the Holy Spirit. As a result of that grace through faith, right, there's something that happens to you. Let's say it together. We are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's our job in this world, is to bring good works to our world that desperately needs to see that Christians make a difference, you see. And let me just prove it to you via this text. It's our gospel reading. Pastor Tim read it a moment ago, but let's look at it again, because I need to uh, emphasize some important points within this text. So John chapter 6 is actually, by the way, where Jesus calls himself the bread of life. But I want you to notice notice what Jesus does first. All right, the bread of life is uh, is, uh, verse 35. But all right, John 6, verses 1 to 15. I'll wait just a second for you to get there. So yeah, while, while I'm setting this up, by the way, so remember that the Sea of Galilee is also called the Sea of Tiberias, and it's also called the Lake of Gennesaret. All three of those names are used in the Gospels. Sea of Galilee, Sea of Tiberias, and Lake of Gennesaret. All right, so uh, after this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, uh, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd followed him there because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on a mountain, and he, there he sat down with his disciples. Now, there's, so there's a lot of people. There's Passover. The Passover of the, of the Jews, I'm sorry, Passover, the feast of the Jews was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? Notice his concern and notice why it's his concern. That's the, that's the next verse, verse 6. He said this to test him for he himself knew what he would do. 
All right? Now, why is that important? What's the test? The test is to see if these disciples understand that Christianity is, in fact, yes, proclamation of the gospel message, Jesus being the bread of life. And if you come to him, you'll never hunger, you'll never thirst, right? <clears throat> Forgive me. My allergies are terrible, right? <laughs> They're always bad, but it's especially today. So, yes, indeed, that's true that he's the, the bread, the way to heaven. I can, I'm loved by God and going to heaven when I die, but he's concerned about hungry people too. In fact, um, if you haven't seen Pastor Ben's sermon on John 21 when Jesus had the, the breakfast on the beach, I would encourage you to watch it. Great sermon. Great sermon. Especially because Pastor points out, he goes, Why did Jesus cook breakfast for them on the beach? Well, it's really very simple. They fished all night, and he knew they would be hungry. And he cares about that. And he proves that here with the feeding of the 5,000. So he said this, verse 6, to test him, for he knew himself what he would do. Philip answers, you know the story, but let me finish it. 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they for so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. That, in other words, that's plenty. Give it to me. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000. Uh, men, that means there were more wives and children, of course. Uh, Jesus then took loaves, uh, the loaves. When he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told the disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. And we've, we've crossed this bridge in another uh, gospel, but remember that they pick up 12 basketfuls, a lesson for each of the disciples in those baskets, you understand. 12 baskets, 12 disciples. Now I bring you here again again to say that we are called, yes, to live our faith, push away sin, live our faith in Jesus in that way, whatever I do in word or deed. But part of that is reaching into people's lives. And yes, feed the hungry, assuage the thirst, clothe the naked, visit the sick and in prison. All of those things are true, but also hold the hand and be a listening ear and be present in people's lives. And be concerned about what they're going through. And love people in the way that God has loved you. Without condition, you understand. That's what he calls us to do, Christian. In very tangible ways, speaking into the lives of people what it means to be a Christian person. And that is, it's not about me. It's not about me. It's about loving God and loving neighbor every single day until that day that I see Jesus face to face. Amen? Amen. All right. So my bride is a wonderful note card writer. In fact, she's got this thing that, and I've been telling people, I didn't ask her permission to tell us, but I don't think she cares about this. <laughs> we will find out if she cares. Let's put it that way, all right, since she's sitting in the room. Uh, but during Lent, she writes note cards, one for each day of Lent. So 40 notes during the course of Lent to, to people, various, various people. Uh, and so the reason I mention that is she makes it easy on me for Christmas and, and uh, birthday gifts. I get her note cards because she uses them a lot. And so I've been amazed when I'm in Target and in Walmart, uh, which is pretty much the only places I go, uh, <laughs> period, but, I, uh, but uh, in their note card section, man, there's a lot of thank you notes, a lot of different thank you notes. You know, there's the, the hand script thank you notes, very flowing. And then there's the really bold thank you, you know, on the, on the front, you know. There's just all sorts, some have flowers, some have birds, all sorts of thank you notes. And yet they all are for the same pers purpose, right? Saying thank you to people. And I'm looking at a bunch of thank you notes sitting in front of me. All different all different experiences, and yet for one purpose, giving thanks to God for what God has done for us. May you be able to do that and encouraged in these days. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.